The season of Lent is 40 days long, which is good because we have a lot of praying and mending to do. Broken relationships, broken systems, broken promises. It's enough to break your heart right in half. But God calls us to take courage to bind up broken hearts, including our own. The season of Lent is 40 days long, which is good. We have 40 days to confess and mend and create a new future together. 40 days to fast from the busyness and keep Sabbath. 40 days to build up our strength and help put the world back together again, one stitch at a time. So that together we might rise again with Jesus for the 50 days of Easter, stronger than before, stitched back together and ready to welcome that new and dawning day. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we center ourselves for worship, we light a candle. Wherever you are worshiping God today, if it's in a safe space to do so, you are invited to light a candle too, as a reminder that Christ is always with us. Together, let us worship Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Hi everyone, welcome to worship and welcome to the Message for Young Disciples. So today we have some exciting things we are looking forward to as we move towards Palm Sunday and as we move towards Easter. And stay tuned for um, particular announcements about children's opportunities uh, on Easter Sunday. That's really something we're getting excited about and excited to share that with you soon. So stay tuned for that. Today, after worship, we will be making sandwiches again for Martha's Table. So if you'd like to be part of that, join us on the 11 a.m. Bible Study Zoom link. That can be found in the children's bulletin that you got emailed. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, a story about a man named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was a tax collector who lived during the time of Jesus. And oftentimes, we hear stories about Jesus helping and standing up for the poor and the sick and the hurt and people who were not, people who were treated not very nice and people who were looked down upon just because of some aspect of how they were. And this story today is really interesting to me because Zacchaeus is not poor and he's not sick. He is actually a tax collector, which means he is one of the most powerful and richest people in Jesus's town. And he was so curious about Jesus that he actually climbed a tree to see him as Jesus was walking one day because there were crowds all around him and so he had to climb a tree to see. So Jesus one day chose to visit Zacchaeus and to have dinner with him. And I think this story is really important because how many times do we think like maybe in school we can or in the world we can really see people who are hurting or who are sick or who don't have many friends, right? Or who are very lonely, who have a really hard time in life. And it can be, it can be really hard to go help them, but it can also be, but we kind of know, we know that we need to go help them. Sometimes though, we see people who are really powerful or really popular uh, and we don't know that we kind of have, well, we don't know maybe that we need to go help them or we might have kind of a little bit of a grudge against them. We don't maybe like them so much and we're like, yeah, I really don't want to get to know you. 
But Jesus actually went to dinner at Zacchaeus's house and went and got to know him. So not only does Jesus go to know and move towards and love the people who are sick and lonely, but he also goes towards to know and love the people who are in positions of power. So Jesus was a great listener and he always spoke the truth. And the cool thing about truth is that whoever you speak it to, it can serve as a bridge towards God. So it can be spoken to people who are on the margins and who are, are sick and who are hurt or are lonely. And it can also be spoken to people in popular positions or in powerful positions. And it brings us all together and closer to God. And so it's important to be able to do both. So that is our message for today. I hope to see some of you at sandwich making and hope you have a great week ahead. We center ourselves for worship today with these words. Holy One, you seek us out wherever we are, even as we try to avoid your call. We are like Zacchaeus, who Jesus approaches. Jesus seeks us out and welcomes himself into our home, and our lives are never the same from this moment of hospitality. Following Jesus leads us to do bold things, like give our money away, and he invites us to recognize the ways that money was that our money was maybe earned through a process of exploitation in the first in the first place. That money, in so many ways, is never really ours to begin with. Remind us that, like the story of Zacchaeus, we are called to be your people through relationship. We are called to encourage one another to be more loving and more generous and more embracing of the imago dei, the image of God, by being in relationship. 
Just as Zacchaeus doesn't choose to give his money away on his own, none of us can create the reign of God here on earth by ourselves. It is only by saying yes to those invitations and recognizing these places for growth in one another and in ourselves that we can grow into how God created us to be. So Holy One, let us enter this time of worship, embracing the affirmations and the opportunities that we can live into your call more faithfully. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let us join together in our prayer of approach and confession, praying, O oh, guiding God, the mighty power of your love leads us into the vulnerability of compassion, justice, and mercy. You are as close to us as our next breath and nearer than the need of a neighbor. You abide with us through the barren places and the death-shadowed valleys of life. You make room for us in our humanness and call us to be about the work of making room for others. So we give you praise. Even as we do so, we acknowledge that we fall short of living fully into your best intentions for us. Our actions do not always match what we say we believe. Where these do not align, forgive us and give us the wisdom, the courage, the humility, and the peace to find our strength in you. Let us lift our prayers to God together now in silence. God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So let us receive the gift of grace with open hands and open hearts, open minds, that our spirits might be renewed and refreshed for the work ahead. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and freed to try again. So hear the sound of love poured out. O oh Lord, open our lips. Praise the Lord. Amen.
sacred head now wounded with grief and shame way down now scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown O sacred head what glory what bliss till now was thine yet though despised and gory I joy to call thee mine be near when I am dying oh show thy cross to me and for my rescue flying come Lord and set me free these eyes new faith receiving from Jesus shall not move for one who dies believing die safely through thy love die safely through thy love as you prepare to hear pastor katie read this passage from the gospel of luke I invite you to listen to the common theme in these three stories, a, a theme of seeing and not seeing. Pay attention to how many times visual verbs are used. Think about who sees, and who really doesn't see in this text that you are about to hear. Will you pray with me? Holy One, as we prepare our hearts to receive once again the reading and proclamation of your word, we pray that you would help us to wrestle with it as though it is truly that inspired gift of your spirit sent straight into our hearts that our lives might be transformed through it. So bless the preacher now in preaching and your word truly to our hearing. Amen. Our gospel lesson comes to us today from Luke chapter 18, verse 31 through chapter 19, verse 10. Listen now for the word of God. Then he took the 12 aside and said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the son of man by the prophets will be accomplished for he will be handed over to the Gentiles. And he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they have flogged him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. But they understood nothing about these things. In fact, what he had said was hidden from them. And they did not grasp what was said. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people when they saw it praised God. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, 
and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he is gone to be a guest of the one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock, and our redeemer. And may the gospel be more to us than mere words. May your Holy Spirit produce in us strong conviction. Amen. The first blind person I ever really came to know was a member of the church that Judith and I served in North Carolina. Her name was Jeannie Setzer. Jeannie was born in 1926 in what was then known as the Congo to missionary parents. By the time she reached young adulthood, she had totally lost her physical sight due to retinitis pigmentosa, and it never returned. But Jeannie had an ability to see what really mattered that transcended the physical. Jeannie was wise and warm and incredibly accepting and progressive in her thinking. She and her husband, Tom, who was co-chair of the nominating committee that called me and Judith to that congregation, had a heart for justice and mercy, and she taught her children and grandchildren to be that way too. As one of her sons put it in a conversation we had the other night, his mom loved unconditionally, and she would never, by the way, want to be put on a pedestal. The epitaph on Jeannie's tombstone reads, she saw more than most. I believe that's true. And I'm grateful that her spirit or her memory nudged me a few nights ago as I was pondering what the three stories Pastor Katie just read have to say to you and me in this particular moment in time. Because they are stories about what it means to see and not see as God sees. Even though one of them features a blind man literally receiving his sight again, I am convinced that the Gospel of Luke means for us to grasp that as a metaphor and not just as a miracle. There is a reason Luke relates these episodes in order. The question of who, of who can really see and who can't, and how and why, runs through them all. Let's start with Jesus talking to his 12 disciples. Did you notice that the first word out of his mouth is see? Then when Jesus goes on to tell them for the third time, by the way, that when they get to Jerusalem, he is going to be handed over and suffer and die and rise again, Luke says, they understood nothing about all these things. In fact, what he said was hidden from them. They just couldn't see it. Well, of course they couldn't. The great muckraking journalist of the first half of the 20th century, Upton Sinclair, wrote in debriefing his failed run for governor of California in 1934, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Amending that slightly, it is nearly impossible to get people to understand something when the viability of their whole worldview and their own sense of security depends on their not understanding it. Let's be clear. This wasn't the first time Jesus had told his closest followers that his life was going to involve suffering and death and rising again, but that didn't fit with their vision of who he was. They knew he was a Messiah, a savior, but they were looking for that salvation to play out in a different way than, you know, 
being vulnerable enough to be hurt or loving their enemies or being subject to death. Following him wouldn't mean they'd get to avoid crushing disappointments, the disease and death of dear ones, their own or others' bewildering betrayals, or their own illness and mortality. It simply meant that those things would not have the last word. Now, that's one thing to affirm in la-di-da theory and a much harder thing to see and hold on to when you're carrying your own cross, dealing with your own disappointment coming to grips with your own or a loved one's death. It's one thing to affirm that Jesus called the disciples to follow him in laying down their lives, and quite another to take in what that might mean for how we deal with our own power and privilege. In that regard, I find it interesting that in each of the first three Gospels, the healing of a blind man, or in Matthew's case, two blind men, follows right on the heels of Jesus' third foretelling of his suffering and death and resurrection. Matthew and Mark tuck in an additional story before that encounter with the blind man, give us an even better look at the disciples' lack of spiritual sight. Right after Jesus tells the twelve about his suffering and death, James and John ask Jesus, or they tell their mom to ask Jesus, depends on which gospel, to do whatever they ask. When Jesus responds, what do you want me to do for you? They ask if they can sit on his right hand and his left hand when he comes in his kingdom. And when they do, when they do ask that, the other 10 become infuriated. That is when the gospel writers tell the story of Jesus healing of the one or two who were blind. Even though our text from Luke jumps right past that unfortunate episode with James and John and straight out to the road into Jericho, we do well to keep it in mind. I think we are meant to hear the contrast between what the disciples ask for and argue about, including the sense of entitlement they have, give us whatever we want, and by the way, what we want is to sit on your right and left, and the crying out of and the restoring to sight of the blind beggar on the road. Again, I think this story is meant to be as much or more a metaphor as it is a miracle. Where the disciples jockey for places of honor, the blind man asks only for mercy and to be able to see again. It is so easy to lose our focus in this world in which we live. It is so easy to get turned in on self, to operate out of a fear of scarcity rather than a recognition and appreciation of abundance, to think only of ourselves or our families or our inner circles, to lose sight of all but our own concerns. That's when we benefit from joining the beggar on the road and praying, have mercy on me and let me see again. Let me look up and gain a fresh perspective. Let me look beyond my own worries. Let me really see the people who are so often ignored or regarded as less than or viewed as a threat or a caricature. Let me see people with your eyes, Jesus. Eyes that see deeper than the surface things that make us different to the common humanity and desire to be treated fairly and with dignity that we all share. It would be a cliche to say that my former parishioner, Jeannie Setzer, didn't see color or ethnicity or sexual orientation. She literally didn't, of course. And yet she knew well enough that people of different races and ethnicities and sexual orientations had their own unique experiences, that they were treated differently in the wider society that she lived in. She didn't pretend that they didn't, that they weren't. She didn't pretend that injustice was okay or that her experience of the world was normative. What Jeannie did was love and listen. What she did was see human beings and the longing that we all share to be treated with human dignity and to receive grace and mercy. And she taught her family to live that way too. She loved and saw the humanity, even in people others might have cast aside having forfeited that right. Which brings us to our third story of seeing. 
one about good old Zacchaeus, the tax collector who scrambled up into the branches of a sycamore tree in order to see this Jesus he'd heard tell of. The parade route through Jericho was apparently jam-packed, so a short person like Zacchaeus had to get to a higher vantage point to be able to get a good look. In addition to being short, Zacchaeus was rich. He made his money off the bent backs of his fellow Israelites, collaborating with Rome and taking an additional share of the taxes off the top for his pay, which meant that he was not, to put it mildly, a popular figure. Plenty of people had, to use a tax term, written him off, but not Jesus. In the story, Jesus looks up and sees him. It's the same Greek verb there, by the way, as the man whose sight he's just restored, anablepsis, to see again or to look up. Jesus looks up and sees Zacchaeus. And not only does Jesus see him, he invites himself into Zacchaeus' house. That's how the God we know in Jesus works, by the way, inviting herself into our lives where she can get into our kitchens and and maybe help us see the world in new ways and move beyond self-preoccupation and out into service and beyond being armored up into vulnerability, beyond protecting and denying our power to using it on behalf of others. She shows up in the itinerant preacher and miracle worker who sees Zacchaeus as more than just a cheating collaborator, which transforms him into someone who is willing to give freely from his abundance. And in the blind parishioner who shows us what it means to love unconditionally. And in the young pastor who helps the older ones see in fresh ways. And in the person or the people, or even in the pandemic or other life event, which comes into your life and helps you see that you can live differently and realign your priorities. So what do we do with these three stories then? A few thoughts from this past week as I close. Number one, Thursday night, the Fairfax County Public School Board debated a proposal advanced by the calendar committee and the Religious Observance Task Force to add four additional holidays to the school calendar. Leading up to that meeting, our interfaith partners at Temple Road of Shalom and the McLean Islamic Center asked us to sign on to a letter in support of that initiative, which our session did. And last Sunday night, I recorded and submitted a short video of support that was played at the school board meeting on Thursday. Why would I do that? Because I have come to see the needs of our interfaith partners And I have come to see that as a member of the dominant religion, my power can be used in support of our interfaith partners who are in the minority. How might all of our eyes be opened to using the power we possess for others' sake? Number two. On Wednesday, eight people, including six Asian women, were murdered at spas by a young white man in the Atlanta area who viewed them as agents of temptation. The white sheriff, who had been distributing anti-Asian t-shirts, was quoted as saying the young man had just had a really bad day. We cannot turn a blind eye to the culture of white supremacy that allows for this sort of racism. Charlene Han Powell, the Asian American senior pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Berkeley, in a powerful videotaped message to her congregation, decried the violence carried out in Atlanta, talked about what kind of people worship at her church. She said, we are those who stand with and stand for and stand beside anyone who is judged, hated, even killed because of the color of their skin, their sexuality and gender identity, their beliefs or their background. At the very least, she said, that is the kind of people we hope to be. Then she went on. Perhaps the more pressing question is, who is our God? Ours is a God who loves each and every one of us just as we are, full stop. Ours is a God who does not stand for racism or bigotry or sexism or hatred in any of its various forms. 
Ours is a God who loves beyond human understanding and yet became human that we might come to know just how deep and wide and all-consuming that love really is. Ours is a good and a gracious and a just God. And then Powell concluded, to my Asian siblings out there who are terrified right now, those of you who the world has given yet another reason to feel more scared, more alienated, and more alone, let me assure you, you, my beloved, are not alone. Your church stands with you and for you and beside you. We see you. We love you. But most of all, God sees you and God loves you. If we have been unclear about that before, forgive us. We will do better. We must do better. Perhaps our eyes have been opened again this week. How can we do better and be better and see better? And finally, number three, I am challenged by the memory of my former parishioner, Jeannie, who truly did see more than most. Which leads me to the question, how can we see and bring out the best in people like Jesus did with Zacchaeus? What and who around us are we failing to see? What is hidden from us by our own inability to grasp that following Jesus isn't about avoiding hardship and loss and physical disability, but bringing love to bear in the midst of it. How can we have our sight restored? In Jesus' name, amen.
you pray with me? Holy One, we come before you today as those seeking to see you and know you. And yet we come to you as those who are sought and as those who are known. We give you such thanks, God, for all of the ways that you remind us that we are always redeemable, that no one is out of your sight or away from your love. We thank you, God, for this opportunity today to reflect upon the ways that you invite us into hospitality, the ways that you show up in our lives, insisting that we welcome you into our homes and into our hearts, into our lives. We pray today, God, for all who feel like they need to climb a tree to see you, just to catch a glimpse. We pray today, God, for all who feel far away from you, and we lift up to you all those in our own lives that we know are hurting, those who are ill, those who are lonely, those who are suffering through addiction, domestic violence, those who are longing to touch your cloak to find the healing that they so desire. Holy One, we lift all of your beloved children to you, those we know and those whose names we will never know. But we trust that you know them, that you care for them. We lift to you our prayers in one voice, to you who are our seeker, you who we are seeking. We lift our prayers to you, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Pray with me. Holy One, we give thanks for the ways that you bless our lives. You come into our lives and radically change them, calling us to share more generously. Let us learn from the story of Zacchaeus, who followed your call so faithfully that he gave away all his possessions. He left his job to follow your call. He devoted himself fully in time, talent, and treasure to follow you. Let us live in the spirit of Zacchaeus today, whose story of radical generosity started with a simple invitation to hospitality. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Friends, as we leave this time of worship and head out into the rest of our day and the rest of our week, I invite us into the challenge of being people who see more than most. How can we see better? How can we be better? And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, be and abide with each and every one of us today and every day evermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.